So welcome to today's CBMM talk. Um, it's great, really great to have Daniela Ras coming here. She, she's of course the director of CSAIL, um, a great leader. Um, I think you all know her. Um, and uh, from time to time, she has this great, wonderful, simple, beautiful ideas in robotics, but which we read in papers and in the news, in the tech news. Um, and she's uh, also a great friend of CBMM, has been a great advisor for me. And um, it's somebody who really likes the problem of the brain and not just uh, artificial intelligence, although artificial intelligence, of course, is also a great problem. Thank you for this kind introduction. Uh, it's, it's really a, a great pleasure to be here um, to share some of our ideas um, with the CBMM uh, community. And um, um, so today um, we will tell you about a new idea we have been pursuing together uh, with Dr. Ramin Hassani, who will uh, present uh, most of the talk. And um, the, the basic idea we want to describe with you uh, uh, aims to bring the natural world and the engineering world closer together. Um, and um, uh, Ramin and I are, are going at this problem in part because we have a general uh, curiosity and desire to understand intelligence in part because when I look at uh, the state of the art in the field of uh, artificial intelligence, I see a lot of advancements. And I see that these advancements are, uh, are really using decades old ideas that are enhanced by computation and data. And so natural question is whether this is intelligence. Um, another question is, are there other ideas? Can we use the natural world to, um, to inspire us? Uh, to, um, uh, to think uh, differently. Because I believe if we don't come up with new ideas, then our results are going to become increasingly more incremental because more and more people will be plowing the same field. And so, uh, so we, the, the field really desperately ne needs some new ideas. And, um, and the, the idea that, um, that uh, Ramin will describe today uh, aims to, uh, to build machine, um, learned models that are much more compact, much more sustainable, and much more explainable than, um, than the models that are based on deep neural networks. And so let me just say um, that much. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce more formally, Dr. Ramin Hassani. Ramin is a postdoc in my group. Prior to joining my group, he was a PhD student at the Technical University in Vienna. And prior to that, he did his master's degree at um, Politecnica di Milano. And so um, with that, Ramin, please join us and uh, tell us about your vision and results. So hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Daniela, for the introduction. And thanks, Professor Poggio. Um, all right, I'm very excited to be here presenting Liquid Neural Networks, a class of artificial intelligence algorithms that tries to bring a little bit of neuroscience in a structured way to um, machine learning. So if you look at neural activity in brains in general, see on the left side, you see the brain activity of a, a mouse. And on the right side, you see uh, one of the networks that we trained end-to-end -end, a controller for controlling an autonomous car. We see that basically like the activation of this, the patterns and activations maybe superficially look very similar. But in principle, there are fundamental differences. Okay, there are huge gaps between intelligence as we know them in brains compared to deep models. In particular, representation learning capacities. Okay, how natural brains actually approach the um, you know, organization of the world around them. To make, use of, to, to make use of them, to be able to control them to achieve their goals. So we know that um, natural brains interact highly with their environments in order to understand their world. So for, by, by understanding 
I mean when they can actually interact with the world and uh, to capture causality, basically, like the causal structure of the task that they are performing. And uh, this is one of the reasons where natural brains can actually go out of distribution, where statistical machine learning, by definition, we stay in IID, right? And um, this is one area that would be extremely beneficial if we can um, explore more and maybe bring some of those insights from natural brains back to artificial intelligence. And at the same time, um, we know that brains are much more robust and much more flexible in terms of a perturbation or the environments uh, that they are getting into, right? And finally, efficiency of the models, right? So the kind of a network is not always active, right? So there is always um, uh, some part of the network that is taking care of the computations that is on demand. So allow me to demonstrate this uh, kind of a, a, a typical statistical end-to-end -end machine learning system, right? So where you have inputs that are a stream of from camera inputs, and then you have a deep neural network that is take care of the kind of, let's say, steering angle of a car, okay? So in this kind of framework, what we're seeing, we're seeing the activity of the network. And um, we see that um, this network is actually a real world tested on, on, on the real car, you know, like, and these are like demonstrations from the test set where they're actually deployed in the environment. They have been trained uh, uh, using human data and they're now deployed, okay? So one of the things that we actually looked into is their, um, basically the attention of this network, right? Like what kind of representation has been learned? What pixels are the most important pixels when a driving decision is being made? So this CNN actually learned to attend to the sides of the road where we see lighter regions in this attention map in order to take driving decisions. And that's not the actual causation. When you're, taking, when you're driving, you're not just looking around, right? You're looking into the road and in front of you, right? So you want to actually have your focus on that perspective. So the causal structure here is missing, although the task is being completed by the network. Now, if you add some noise on top of the image, like a little bit of noise, we see that this attention map is not even reliable anymore, okay? Even if this noise is kind of a small uh, Gaussian uh, uh, perturbation, you can see that uh, it has huge influence on the decisions and the consistency of the decisions that the network makes. So how can we improve this by bringing neuroscience in? As Mar and Pojo said and, uh, and set up a framework for us for actually creating, uh, let's say if you want to explain a biological system, you want to say at a system level, you can look, look at it from a system level and find out like what are the goals of the system and what are the kind of mechanism that actually you get to the goals? That's the system level. And then you can also have this view of uh, looking into building blocks of these things, going down and looking into like how uh, intelligence emerges from cells, right? You can go down and basically like use computational models, precise mechanisms that exist in biology. So having this kind of framework in mind, what we can do like, and that's what we did. I'm just showing you an outline of how this research is a summary of what this research is about. So we looked into nervous system of a small species and um, we got down into neural circuit level. And even for understanding neural circuits, we actually went into the neuron and synapse level even further and to explain like to really fundamentally figure out like what are the building blocks there. And you know that you can even go lower than that and computationally model it down to atoms, right? But there is actually a level that you have to satisfy yourself that you don't want to go below that in order to actually get there and then take this model and see what kind of capabilities you can have using the engineering, like super advanced machine learning frameworks that recently got developed. So we stopped at a certain level, which I'm going to explain throughout the talk. And we saw that these models are much more expressive than their compartments in deep learning. Although the kind of abstraction that we did is like really simple, simple but in terms of like how, how much ca capacity these networks can generate, they are much more expressive. And I'm gonna show you the math behind and also the experimental evidence for that. 
these systems can handle memory and these systems can handle explicit and implicit memory mechanisms that I will explain throughout the talk. More importantly, these systems can capture the true causal structure of the data. And that's part, uh, part of the reason why, why these systems actually are, can be helpful in those kind of this uh, closed form real world decision-making processes. The systems are uh, basically robust to, to perturbations and we can use them for generative modeling. We can even use them for extrapolation. You can go out of distribution with these type of networks because if, if, some, if some process can capture the causal structure of the data and you can prove that that's the case, then the system is being able to actually go even out of distribution. And with that in mind, we actually try to perform decision-making in real world robotics. We are a um, distributed robotics lab and we want to bring this insight into the brains, right? Now, to show you what kind of change we have, we have done, you can look at this system. This system has now on the uh, right-hand side, what you see is the 19 nodes of the system that is sparsely connected together and this is like described by that model that actually we developed. And then you can actually get into attention maps that are much more kind of um, focused on the true causal structure of the task, okay? And this is not uh, just um, on this task, but we can actually see more throughout the talk. But how do you get started for creating a model, okay? Let's look into the, uh, uh, like, let's say like interaction of two neurons, and, and the synaptic kind of propagation between information propagation between the two. So neural dynamics are typically given, unlike deep learning systems, they're given with uh, continuous processes and they're described by differential equations, okay? So synaptic release is not just the scalar weight. So synaptic release can be modeled with much more sophisticated kind of mechanisms, right? So you would be able to actually put, like you can really get down to probability of if a neurotransmitter is actually going to stick to the receptors of the second neuron, right? So you can really get into the process, like how much complexity, you can really add nonlinearity to the system. Now, and there are also recurrence in the structure, there's memory and there is a sparsity all over the place in, in neural circuits. So having these principles in mind, the goal, is to actually incorporate these small principles that I mentioned into improving representation learning, improving the robustness of machine learning model and statistical models, and at the same time, improving their interpretability. So to get into a common ground between the computational world of neuroscience and the machine learning systems, I would like to uh, start exploring, like, where do we have continuous dynamics? Okay, so let's, let's start with this processes that has been recently brought up, continuous time or continuous steps models, right? Through in the machine learning community. So a continuous time neural network is basically where when a neural network F that has certain number of layers, has certain width, it has a activation function of choice, right? And uh, it, it is a function of its hidden states, its inputs, and it's parametrized by parameters theta. So if a neural network F parametrizes the derivatives of the hidden state, then you would have a continuous time process. Now it is, it's, it's gonna be a continuous time neural network. With this representation, you can go from a discrete computation, computational graph, like in residual networks that we have, like you would actually take a computation step each layer. Now, if you define your system like the way we show it here, you have the depth, the, the depth dimension of your system becomes continuous. And when you have a continuous time system, then you would have uh, a lot of advantages. First of all, the space of possible uh, functions that you could actually explore and generate is much more than that of the discrete representations. The second advantage is the uh, arbitrary computation. So you can, you don't need to perform computation at every time a step. You can have arbitrarily step time uh, a computation. So your depths becomes very variable basically. So it can be infinitely depths kind of networks with one process. And um, 
this would naturally, this continuous process would be a natural fit for modeling sequential behavior. So let's say compared to the normal recurrent neural networks that you know, the updated state of a neural network is actually given in a, with, the, with this discretization. If you have a neural ODE and basically a more stable version of that, where it has a damping factor, then you can use this also as a recurrent neural network. On the top row, you see the interpolation and extrapolation uh, capability of a recurrent neural network on irregularly sampled data that are put around the spiral. And we see that the, the red line in between is actually extrapolation capability of this model, where it cannot actually capture the dynamics very well. But on the bottom row, you would actually see that the dynamic process generated by a continuous time recurrent neural network is actually captures those dynamics properly and even, even extrapolates to that. So this is nice. Now, how do we implement these things? I'm just going through the details of, of how to implement these type of models. So you basically, you want to actually, because they're ODEs, you want to use numerical ODE solvers, right? So you basically unroll this difference and then uh, you, can, you can use any type of uh, numerical ODE solver. Let's say we use an explicit Euler solver, right? And then there you can actually create the forward pass of your network based on uh, this, this unrolled version of your network. And then choice of this ODE will actually define the complexity of your map, right? You can use a more complex adaptive solvers that has adaptive step sizes to have a more accurate forward pass. How do you do now do backward pass? You can use a, use a mathematically known uh, adjoint sensitivity method where um, let's say you have a loss function and your dynamic is given by a neural ODE. So your loss function, basically, if you, have, if you have the dynamic of your system is starting from T0, given by this time, and you have labeled data, you can compute the output dynamic to compute a loss. And this loss is getting computed by running this ODE solver, which basically give you this trajectory. And then the adjoint method actually creates a new state the accelerate differential equation that gives the uh, connects the dynamics of the loss in respect to the state of the system and then you can run this ODE backward one step at a time to create to get the gradients of the loss in respect to the state of the system and at the same time you would be able to also get the gradient of the loss in respect to the parameters of the system so this adjoint sensitivity method on the backward pass would give you uh, a constant memory propagation because it actually forgets the previous states and it's just do one step at a time computation when it does back propagation. You can also train this network by back propagation through time gradient based. And what you do, you perform one forward pass and then you compute the derivatives of your um, kind of uh, 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 based on the chain rule, you can actually co compute the, your derivatives and you can update your parameters. This way, you are actually not treating the solver in a, a black box manner. So the solver is actually, you're actually going through the solver. So the dynamics of the solver becomes part of your gradient as well. So you need to be careful about that. But at the same time, the memory complexity of this method is really high, but it is much more accurate than the adjoint method if you use it in a bundleless sense. So I told you how these models are getting implemented forward and backward. Now we have this neural ODE. Okay, so we said the continuous time processes and they can, this representation actually can have a spatial temporal uh, 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 kind of uh, data processing powers and it can actually really be, uh, has a really good potential. But we didn't define any biological process there. We didn't actually get any inspiration from the biological uh, insights that I talked before. And a really funny fact is that like when you deploy them in real world, they're even worse than a simple long short term memory network, right? So basically what's, what's the point, right? Like if you, if you define like a really fancy equation, they cannot even work in real world applications very well, then uh, what are we even doing, right? So let's improve, okay? Now by this improvement, what we want to do, we want to get into biology. I told you that 
activity of neurons are described by differential equations and you can actually model the dynamics of a cell by, uh, or of a membrane by, as a leaky integrator, right? And with this simple linear dynamics. And the more important part is a conductance-based uh, synapse model where you can have a nonlinearity included in the synapse of the system and not in the neurons of the system. So basically the interaction between two nodes or two differential equations is given by a nonlinearity. And this is what is inspired by channel modeling behavior of Hodgkin and Huxley when they did uh, channel modeling of, you know, like ion channels. So you can actually get into this kind of a steady state behavior from those differential equations of Hodgkin Huxley. You can reduce them into this abstract form. And if you want to bring it, the nonlinearities look like a sigmoid and activation function. So you would actually can, in principle, bring neural networks inside artificial neural networks in the representation of a synapse. Now, putting these two systems, very simple things, has been there for century, over a century together, you will get a dynamical system of such. And this dynamical system has certain properties and certain advantages. It's obviously a neural ODE. It's an ODE-based neural network. It has a component neural network F, a nonlinearity, that appears in the coefficient of X of T, or a state of your system, and in the state of the system itself. So there is a coupling between the state and the time constant of your differential equation. So at the same time, that F for that linear, like let's say, let's, let's say I don't have recurrent connections. So X of T in that F is zero. Then F becomes only a function of I or the inputs of the system. Then the whole system becomes a linear system. Now, if you have that linear system, the coefficient of x of t is input dependent. So input, if the inputs of the system is changing, then the behavior of the, 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 the kind of behavior of the differential equations changes, right? Because that defines the damping factor of your very simple neural network that you have, and a very simple dynamical system that you have. So just to show you like a block diagram, like how does it look like? In a standard neural network, the, the range of possible connections that you might have is basically you can have recurrent. Let's say you have two neurons. They have activation function. You might be able to have like reciprocal connections. You, you might have feedback. You might have an external input to the system and they, are, they have their own scalar weights. Now, in a liquid network, you would have the same kind of a structure, but at the same time, you have a nonlinearity that controls the interaction of two differential equations. So the difference here is that activations are changed to differential equations and their, their interactions are given by a nonlinearity that can be a neural network. So in terms of what does it represent? Let's say I trained a neural network for driving, for autonomous driving from visual data. I'm showing the visual data in the middle. I did that with a standard neural network that has a constant time constant. And I did that with a liquid network, okay? What we are seeing on the X axis is one over tau. That means like one over the time constant of the system. And then what we see here is that, and, and on the Y axis, what we see is the steering angle of the car and the color shows left for blue and uh, yellow for turning right, okay? And in the middle, you have the middle part. So now we see that a neuron actually learned to associate its behavior, its timing behavior without any prior, just to plug in those uh, very simple uh, building blocks together, actually it learned to associate the, the dynamics of the task to its behavior. So that's one of the advantages that you receive from these type of networks. Another property of these networks is that the state of these systems um, are stable and their time constant and their behavior is stable. So if you define the time constant of the system as that expression that is the coefficient of X of T or the hidden states, then you can actually write that down as, um, you know, like relaxing for 
not having a recurrent connection, let's say x of t is out, then you would be able to bound the time constant of the system. And these are actually the bounds that you can have. So the network cannot go unstable. You can also bound the state of the system. Let's say a neuron is receiving many synaptic connections. A in this representation is a, is a synaptic parameter and it's synapse specific. So each synapse has a bias or has an A that actually has a, a connection to this neuron. And now um, basically you can say the maximum of the A parameter would be the maximum amount of, like maximum amount that your state can actually reach. And the minimum of that, like the, the one that has the least one, it actually has the least amount of impact on your activity of your uh, differential equation. We can also show that this biologically inspired system is actually a universal approximator, okay? You can actually do a function approximation, use those methods actually to pr prove that actually this expression can uh, approximate any given dynamics with arbitrary precision given n number of their cells. But to truly actually find out what, how expressive is, neural network, is a neural network from the a theoretical standpoint, we want to get down to a more fine-tuned expression. So for example, uh, there, are more uh, there are more measures of expressivity of neural networks that we can use for measuring uh, expressivity of, of a network. For example, the trajectory lengths. Imagine I have a, tra a circular trajectory and I input this circular trajectory to a deep neural network. Okay, I'm just defining what is this trajectory length measure. Okay, you input this to a neural network. This neural network is parameterized. And then we can observe that at every layer of the network, this trajectory gets deformed, gets more complex. And the lengths of the trajectory getting more complex and complex, and it actually increased exponentially. You can measure that lengths of this trajectory with an arc, arc length measure. And you can actually find the lower bound for the expressivity of the neural network. Given its depths, you can actually measure the expressivity of a neural network uh, by uh, its parametrization, properties of its uh, synaptic parameter, uh, uh, weights, uh, uh, parametrization, the, um, the, the widths of the network and the depths of the network, basically. So we actually did use this expressivity measure because this actually draws a, a boundary between shallow networks and deep networks, right? The deeper you get, the more expressive you can get, okay, based on this measure. Now, uh, in our space, we have continuous time processes, let's say liquid time constant networks or LTCs. We have continuous time neural networks and we have neural ODE representations. Now, if we give the same neural networks like we, input, we parameterize this neural network F for all of these processes given their uh, representation of differential equation, we see that we consistently get longer and more complex trajectories out of the LTC network, okay? Now, we systematically analyze this in an empirical fashion where we change the Basically, the, like on the x-axis, you see different types of ODE solvers for this type of these this three type of networks, neural ODEs, CTRNNs, and LTCs. And we see that the yellow line actually shows the trajectory lengths like for these LTC networks. We see that even if we change the width of a network on the x-axis, we see that the trajectory length is always higher. And we can see that if the, initialization of your network is actually changing, you, you also have a dependency on that. Now, we also figured out like theoretically lower bound for expressivity of um, uh, neural, uh, basically this type of networks where uh, there is a, like the lower bound is a function of beta scale, bias scale, widths of the network, depths of the network and number of discretization steps that you're taking for your ODE. And we also uh, implemented that for LTCs. You cannot compare lower bounds to, show, to say that, yeah, so the, this network is more expressive than the other one, but it's just a good measure to just see where, where are we standing, you know, in terms of like this type of uh, behavior. Now that we have this type of measure and theoretically evaluated them, let's really 
like put these networks in action and let, let's see how good they are in representation learning. So one of the things we start with modeling physical dynamics. When I told you that a neural ODE cannot beat an LSTM network, you see that here, okay? And you see that we can actually get better performances by using these networks. You can compare them versus like across like a large uh, a series of uh, advanced RNNs. And this bio-inspired network is actually uh, beating them even in person activity in a real example, just to uh, uh, perform in, 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 in irregularly sampled data. We, we also performed uh, like some analysis on some real world examples. And, and we saw that on most of these tasks, LTCs are better. The ones that, for example, one task is LSTM is better. And that's the task where we have longer term dependency. And that's one of the issues that you have to solve. Gradient propagation in continuous time processes is, is problematic. So you always have to take care of, if you actually tune the, uh, uh, actually wrap them inside a kind of well-behaved gradient propagation, then you would be also getting a better performance there. We didn't stop there and we actually scaled the applications to this end-to-end -end autonomous driving that at the beginning I showed you. We have human collected data and uh, we trained deep learning models. Typically a deep learning pipeline would actually looks like that when you want to have like a set of convolutional heads and then you would have like fully connected networks that has the uh, 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 basically like the over parameterization part of your network is actually there in the hidden layers between five to 100 million parameters it takes to actually perform lane keeping or this type of task. If you have this type of networks, what we did, we said that let's replace the fully connected uh, networks by continuous time processes. And let's see what kind of uh, behavior we get. So we get four types of variants. We take a neural circuit policy, which is the first one NCP that has a four layer architecture, again, nature inspired that um, has interneurons, command neurons, and motor neurons, all LTC-based neurons, based on what the, uh, the, the masses I showed you before. You can replace that fully connected layer with LSTMs and CTRNNs, and you have the convolutional neural network. So I'm gonna talk about the differences of these four variants. So the first thing, the number of parameters that requires to actually perform autonomous driving is basically significantly reduced when you're using these type of networks. Now, remember the representation of the network where I was showing that convolution on a fully connected convolutional network can get perturbed, the kind of representation they learn. And now with LTCs, we would be able to have 19 neurons at control. And then we perform and, and see that the convolutional Part of the, so what I'm showing in the attention map, we are not changing the convolutional neural network structure of, of, of these variants, of these network variants that I showed you. We see that this architecture imposes an inductive bias on the convolutional networks that let them learn a causal structure. Now, if we add even noise, we see that the explanations are not scattered as much as it was for convolution and neural networks. We also take, took a real world measure of this, like how, how many crashes would you have if you increase the amount of input noise? And you will see that these kind of networks are basically much more robust to these type of perturbations. And now let's look at the convolutional neural network attention of these end-to-end -end trained networks when their heads are different when they had a CTRNN, when they had an LSTM, and when they had our um, LTC-based model. Okay, and we see that the kind of prior that the recurrent neural network had put on convolutional neural networks makes them learn different types of weights. So the representations that are learned out of the system are completely different from each other. And we see that the only one that has a consistent behavior, I mean, is the CNN itself, and, um, and our solution, but CNN actually focuses on consistently on the outside of the road. So we, we don't want that. LSTM is actually giving you a good, most of the time, a good representation, but it is actually sensitive to lighting condition. So if, if I stop the video in some parts, you will see that when the shading areas are not good, 
the attention of that uh, LSTMs are actually getting scattered. And the CTRNN or the OD, uh, uh, neural ODEs basically cannot actually gain a nice representation in this task. Now, why is this the case? Okay, now let's explore the why of this. So if you look at the taxonomy of possible modeling frameworks, at the bottom, at one end of this, but I don't want to call it bottom, so at one end of this spectrum, we have the statistical models, where statistical models are amazing in learning from data, and at the same time, basically uh, performing inference in IID, so predicting in IID, right? So this is actually what the uh, statistical models can do. On the other side of the spectrum, we have uh, physical models, right? So physical models are basically described usually by differential equations. When you have differential equations that describes the dynamics of your system, they can actually answer questions about, inter they can account for interventions in the system. So if you can actually design a universal approximator that is closer to this physical represent physical uh, kind of models, then you would actually get a, into a more uh, causal structure by nature. And also you're being able to actually get insights about the system. You can learn from data. You can answer counterfactual questions and predict in IID and out of distribution. So as I said, physical dynamics can be modeled by ODEs. And um, this set of ODEs are actually can actually predict the future evolution of your system. They can describe uh, uh, the results of interventions in the system. And the COP time evolution uh, helps us define averaging mechanisms for capturing the, the statistical dependencies in data. And um, it in enhances our understanding of the physical phenomena. At, and because of that, they are actually causal structures. So now let me get more formal about this. Let's say we have a differential equation given by dx or dt equal to g. And g of x is basically a nonlinearity of the system. So we have the picard lindelof uh, kind of theorem that actually shows that there is a, um, this kind of differential equation would have a unique solution if the nonlinearity is Lipschitz. Now, if you unroll this system with Euler, Euler, then the representation, the underlying representation under this uniqueness condition would be a causal, causal mapping. Why? Because you can actually say what happens in the future of the ev future events, which is the xt plus d dt, based on the previous events. Now, there is a framework within this a spectrum of causal models is called dynamic causal model. So a dynamic causal model has the nonlinearity of the shape that you're seeing. It does take a bilinear approximation or a second order Taylor approximation of that ODE. And it gives you these coefficients for the system. So coefficient one controls the internal coupling of the system, A. Coefficient B, controls the coupling sensitivity among networks nodes. So it actually accounts for internal uh, interactions and interventions. And coefficient C regulates the external inputs. This framework is actually um, a graphical model that is implemented by ODEs. So you can put these things together to actually create this system. They allow for feedback as opposed to the uh, to their kind of Bayesian network architectures that you can actually receive. Now, if we look at the liquid neural networks or the representation that we gain from that um, representation under two conditions that F is C1 mapping, that means like F is Lipschitz continuous basically and is bounded, okay? I didn't write the bounded, no, no I didn't write that. So it has to be also bounded. And, um, and tau is positive, and if, if you have a strictly positive tau, then this network would also have uh, a unique solution, okay? Now, let's say I assume that f of this f, uh, the nonlinearity is given by a tangent hyperbolic. It has recurrent connections, and it has weights, like 
kind of an input mapping, okay? And then I would be able, with this nonlinearity, I would be able to compute the coefficients. I mean, if you look at the coefficients for causal models, we can compute the coefficients of this causal behavior, okay? So that means there are certain parameters of the system that are responsible for a certain type of intervention in the system, internal intervention and external uh, intervention in the system. Just from the, from the diagram perspective, going back to our diagram, we will actually have a dynamic causal model that can, inter that can have the parameter B that controls the amount of uh, collaboration of two nodes with each other or interactions of two nodes. And uh, coefficient C that controls the inputs or external inputs to the system. You would have the same type of behavior from uh, like it's a nonlinear version of that dynamic causal model that actually performs the same thing. And they have like a more sophisticated uh, uh, causal structures. Now with that, we did some experiments. There are uh, behavioral cloning kind of experiments where we have drone agents that are moving in the environment and they're given like, like visually, there is actually a target in the environment and we ask the drones, so we actually we drive the drones towards that target and with this visual demonstration, what we want to do, we want to learn this behavior and, be, and gain like agents that are good in closed loop when they're interacting with the environment. We see that this is actually a learned behavior of this system where as soon as the target becomes apparent, then we see that the, the, this neural network actually learned to focus on that target because that's the kind of important uh, matter in this kind of task process. So basically the causal structure of the task is learned by this drone agent. Now, if you compare the uh, kind of focus or attention of these networks to other neural networks, we see that the only representation that actually we see this type of a process is actually the liquid network based solutions where this attention is not persistent in the other ones. So we cannot say that the other systems actually learned to navigate towards the target and understood what they're doing. We also did that in multi-agent, like right now you're a, a follower drone and there's a leader drone in front of it. And you, you are actually, the target is basically to follow is strong, okay? And in this type of environment also, we observe that the attention of the network is actually always on that, um, on the second drone basically. So that means like the causal structure is actually captured. Now, how you can show this even more quantitatively, then um, we looked into closed form interaction. We trained these networks in open loop and from training data. Now we deploy them actually in that environment and we measure the amount of success rate that they can have in different type of tasks in closed loop. So if they do not have the true causal structure of the task, they wouldn't be able to perform this task very well. And we did like a, across different uh, kind of uh, spectrum of um, perturbations on the system. We see that the systems are being able to perform much better than the other ones. Of course, like there are always room for improvement, like there for even for these systems, because we didn't add like any kind of constraint on helping these systems to learn more and more. So we're just trying to see how much, um, what's the gap between these type of networks and the others. So obviously these type of networks come with uh, certain limitations. So the complexity of the networks are basically uh, tied to the complexity of their ODE solver. So as a result, you might have longer training times and longer test time if you use these networks. You can have a solution for that. You can use a fixed step ODE solvers. You can use the sparse flows. You can use the sparsity to actually, and, and the process that optimizes the sparse neural networks on, on uh, let's say CPUs or any kind of hardware that you're running or GPUs. And then uh, you can use hyper solvers and these are the cl a class of solvers where they can actually integrate everything together and they can actually run much faster when you have uh, um, differential equations. You can also use closed form variants in this kind of scenario. So you can use the closed form. So if you solve this differential equation in closed form, 
then you can end up with a nice representation. And that's one of the things that we did and uh, we're very uh, excited about. So um, there is another limitation that this ODE-based network, they might also express vanishing gradient problem because they're continuous systems and their memory is given by an exponential decay. So then you would face learning long-term dependencies. So the solution is that you wrap it inside a well-behaved uh, kind of process, for example, a gating mechanism that you can actually put uh, these networks together. But for example, if you have the state of an LSTM network defined by um, an LTC network. So if you do that, then you would have gating mechanism and you have like a gradient propagation uh, uh, preserve the gradients. Now, in summary, what I showed you, um, I showed you that you can acquire knowledge by these flexible neural models that can perform inference model free. They can really capture the temporal uh, uh, aspects of the task that, uh, that is at hand better than the, like, like the tasks that require temporal uh, kind of data processing. They can actually infer the call. And th these are all thanks to their causal structure. So, and, and, and they would be able to perform credit assignment uh, better than the other models that are out there. So you have, uh, you might use them for generative modeling and you want, you want you, if you want to model the word, you basically can use these representations for also get a uh, representation of your word in order to do further inference from those kind of models. So there are certain properties that I mentioned, the compositionality of layer-wise, these networks, you can actually put them in different architectures and you can connect them in a sparse fashion and the network is actually differentiable and you can, you can use this. And, and if you want to use a visual kind of, uh, kind of, if you're dealing with visual data or video data, you would be adding like CNN heads or uh, perception modules. And then these can act as your decision-making engine. They're expressive, they're causal, and they add uh, more into interpretability of the networks. So some of the perspectives that we have is that there is, I just put two different uh, 100 years old models together, and this is all uh, kind of properties that emerge from those kind of things. And you can see that how much potential is actually in this type of research that you can put and you can really explore what's going on in the brain and why, why do you need to do that? Because basically the research space is huge if you just wanna algorithmically implement something intelligence, right? So you would, you would narrow down if you actually focus on brains and how they acquire knowledge. And definitely because we have these machine learning tools these days, so you would be able to actually do much more than it was possible before. We can also work with the objective functions that in this uh, talk, like in this research that I showed, you just focus on the model and the properties of the model in a structured fashion. So you can also work with uh, the objective function of your learning problem. You can also, uh, uh, for learning processes, you can use um, kind of physics informed kind of learning processes in order to perform um, this type of learning. You can do uh, causal anthropic forces, for example. This is like defining intelligence as a force that maximizes the future freedom of action. Okay, so that would be like a new way of formulating intelligence. And then you can, from there, you would be able to actually get into much more. So this is actually an exciting area of research that could, uh, could be enabled and scaled by, uh, by what we showed today. So, um, and as I said, like one of the properties that we showed today is that you, there are certain structures that can, be emer can emerge from, uh, from these liquid networks. And those structures are good. So you would be able to use this for more complex tasks. So these are good candidates for, like this could be giving you like some candidates for performing decision-making, better decision-making um, based on these selective computations. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention and all these technologies uh, open source, you can actually get them um, online.